I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture. My name is Brian White, and I'm chair of the Stanford Mathematics Department. This lecture is one of a series of public lectures organized by the Stanford Mathematics Research Center and by the Friends of Stanford Mathematics. This evening, we're very fortunate to have as our speaker, Professor Etienne Gies. Professor Gies is one of the world's leading experts in geometry and dynamical systems. He did his undergraduate studies at the École Normale Supérieure in saint cloud and he received his PhD in Lille in 1979. In 1983, he was named a research fellow of the National Center for Scientific Research. Since 1988, he has been director of research, currently at the École Normale Supérieure in Lyon. He has won numerous awards for his mathematical work, including the Servant Prize of the French Academy of Sciences, the Silver Medal of the National Center for Scientific Research, and the D'Alembert Prize. He became a member of the French Academy of Sciences in 2005, and he was named Knight of the Legion of Honor in 2012. In addition to his research, Professor Gies is known for communicating mathematical ideas to general audiences. For example, he has written a prize-winning expository book on chaos theory, and he has created a film, Dimensions, which introduces the viewer to concepts such as four-dimensional geometry. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gies, who will speak to us about the mathematics of clothing design. Thank you for the introduction. Let me begin by introducing you to the four main characters of my talk. The first one is William Thurston. He was one of the most influential mathematicians of the 20th century. He passed away less than two years ago, and the first motivation for my talk is to pay my respect to him. He had a view of mathematics as something very concrete, very experimental. And in the last years of his life, he had some contact with clothing design. And this is what I want to tell you about. Among his many key concepts that he introduced, there is something called the pleated surfaces. I will not go into the definition. You can see it here if you wish. But this is something which is very, very close to pleating in costumes, in dresses. And indeed, he was bound to meet or to interact sooner or later with the master of pleating. And the master of pleating is the second character of my talk, Issei Miyake the greatest designer, or at least the most famous designer in the world, I would say. He's really, as I told you, the master of pleats. And indeed, in 2010, there was some opportunity for Thurston to collaborate with uh, Issei Miyake in the fashion show, which is very unusual for mathematicians, as you can believe. So let me show you, and this is the second motiva motivation of my talk, is to show you some beautiful dresses. <laughs> so let me show you some pleats by Miyake. One, you see, obviously mathematically inspired. Another one, homme plissé. Here's a third one, beautiful too. And a fourth one, which is really folding you know, folding, pleating, bending, coiling, all these words are mathematical words. So there are connections between mathematics and fashion, and I want to discuss some of them today. The third character of my talk is much older. Is the famous Russian mathematician, oh, I forgot to say you that. This is the picture of Thurston, uh, on the uh, uh, Miyake fashion show in Paris 2010 with the artistic director uh, Fujiwara. 
and here are some pictures of the fashion show uh, in Paris. Next, more serious, <laughs> Professor Chebichov. So uh, Chebichov, uh, Yasha Eliasberg told me two days ago, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, kids were, think, were presented, uh, 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 they, were, uh, they had an idea of Chebichov as being the typical Russian mathematician. So all kids know him. I'm not sure in this country everybody knows Chebichov. But Chebichov was really a fantastic mathematician in probability, in number theory, in approximation theory, and in cutting cloth. He wrote a paper that I will discuss later called Sur la coupe des habits, which is a really fascinating paper on how to cut cloth. And the first hero, the fourth hero of my talk is Sir Christopher Zeman from Warwick. Uh, I fear that I will not have too much time to discuss him. So let me say just a few words now. I hope I have more time later. But at some time in his life, he was interested in cutting a dress for his wife. And uh, he, uh, trying to do that, he understood that the problem was basically a mathematical problem. And then he wrote a paper in a journal called Costume. And the paper is entitled Mathematics Applied to Dressmaking. I hope I have some time to tell you more about this paper at the end of this talk. OK, so let's uh, begin our story by a first attempt, how can we dress people or things or objects with paper? Well, you may, you may say, this is ridiculous. None of us have dresses in paper. But this is not quite true. You cannot imagine the number of fashion shows which are paper shows. So I'm going to show you first a few dresses by Miyake in paper. So you can see how imagination can be rich in design. Here's one, 2011. Another one, 85. The third one, eight dresses in pleats paper. OK, so how can we use paper to clothe people? Believe it or not, the first one who thought about that would be my fifth, my fifth hero today, Euler. Euler was, of course, a very famous mathematician. I'm not sure he had any connection with clothing. But in 1770, he wrote a wonderful paper discussing the question of which surfaces can be covered with paper, allowing bending, but not stretching. So if you think a little bit, if you have a sheet of paper, it is obvious that you can post it on some cylindrical pillar without any stretching. You can also post it on a conical object without stretching. And the question of Euler was, are there more surfaces on which you can deposit a sheet of paper without creating any wrinkle? So uh, cylinders are OK. Cones are OK. Are there more? You know, if you look in the fashion uh, uh, shows today, you can think that designers believe that cones and cylinders are the only solutions. So let me show you a beautiful dress made out of cylinders and cones. Here's the second view. Third one. Cylinders, I told you. But Euler found more solutions. And I want to introduce you to his wonderful paper, dated 1770, 
whose title is De Solidis Quorum Superficiem in Planum Explicare Licet. So I don't speak Latin. I'm pretty sure you don't speak Latin either. So let's try to understand the title. The title is very interesting. Uh, let me try to translate it in English. It says, solids whose surface can be unfolded on the plane. So I like this title very much for, me, for two reasons at least. One of them is that at the time, people like Euler could not think of a surface in a way which was different from the boundary of some object. You know, today when you teach in elementary school, the difference between a sphere and a ball, it's not obvious at all for, for, for kids. For mathematicians, the concept of, of surface is clear. But in the time of Euler, you could not think of a surface as something which was not the boundary of an object. So instead of saying surface, Euler would say solid, whose boundary is a surface. And the second word I like very much in the title is explicare. Explicare, in, it's even, even much, much more clear in French. Expliquer is to unfold, to explain. You have in English to ply for a fold. To explain something is to unfold it. So the idea was it's which surfaces can be explained on the plane. This is a wonderful question. And then if you can try to uh, read the, 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 this paper, uh, I will not try very much, but it says, notissima est proprietas cylindro et coni. Uh, he explains that cylinders and cones can be unfolded on the plane. And the next sentence says that if you try to do it with a sphere, no way. You cannot unroll, you cannot unfold a sphere on the plane. He says uh, somewhere, the uh, nullo modo. It's impossible to unfold a sphere on the plane. And then he says, my duty in this paper is to find the complete list of those surfaces that can be covered with paper. And he gives the solution. So let's, uh, let me explain the solution. Solution comes in two steps. First, I give a definition, which is standard today. One says that the surface is developable if it can be covered with paper, allowing bending but not stretching. And the first theorem of, of Euler is remarkable. It says that a developable surface has to be very specific. More precisely, it has to be a ruled surface. One says that a surface is ruled if, it's, if it is made out of straight lines moving in space. You take a straight line in space, which you let it move, it will develop a surface. This surface is called a ruled surface. And the first theorem of Euler is that if your surface is not ruled, no way you cannot clothe it with paper. But then he explains that to be ruled is not sufficient. Like, for example, here you have a very beautiful surface called a hyperboloid. You can see it is ruled because it is made out of straight lines. But obviously, if you try to post a sheet of paper on it, you will have wrinkles. This ruled surface is not developable. And Euler gives the exact condition for a ruled surface to be developable. And the condition is this. This is a theorem of Euler, which is definitely not easy. I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty sure that most graduate students from Stanford don't know how to prove that. So the theorem says that developable surfaces are very specific. They could be cones, cylinders, or something constructed in the following way. You take a curve in space, and you look at the family of tangent lines to this curve. This family of tangent lines will develop 
will sweep, will define a surface in space which is developable. And the theorem of Euler is that all developable surfaces are built in this way. So you have a huge family of examples that designers should use today, but they don't use it. And uh, 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 let me show you a few, uh, a few pictures. Here's a typical developable surface. You see in the middle, you see a curve in space. And the straight lines that you see on the, on the object, these straight lines are the tangents to this curve. And this family of tangents define the developable surface. Here's another picture of a developable surface, which is clearly made out of paper. OK. Now, in 1899, a very young student called Lebeg was attending a class by a prestigious French geometer called Darboux. And Darboux was teaching this theorem of Euler that uh, every developable surface has to be ruled. And according to the story, uh, 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 Lebeck said, Professor, this cannot be true because my handkerchief is not ruled. So, of course, my handkerchief is flat originally. And when you fold it, it is developable because it has been developed from a flat thing. So, it should be ruled. But obviously, when you look at the picture of the handkerchief, you, you see that. This is not ruled. So it's a counterexample to the theorem of Euler. And the truth is that the theorem of Euler had an assumption. And the assumption was that the surface under consideration has to be smooth. And this is not the case for my uh, handkerchief. This is not the case. So Lebeck created this concept of non-regular surfaces, of non-smooth surfaces. So I will show you how Lebeck constructed his uh, counterexamples to, to, to the theorem of Euler. But before that, I want to show you that uh, Miyake knows how to do that. So here's a beautiful dress, which is obviously developable. But you could say it is ruled because somehow you see some straight lines, some segments on, this, on, on the dress. It is not smooth along these circles, but on the, on, the, on the smooth part, it is ruled. It contains segments. Here's another picture. And uh, just for the pleasure, let's have a look at this is another picture, and uh, let's have a look. So now I show you the proof of the theorem of Lebeg. This is it. So here's the proof of the theorem of Lebeg. You start with a cone. You can think of it as a, as a dress. And then you modify it by taking this um, broken line, consisting here of three pieces, 
of angle 45 degrees, 45 degrees, 45 degrees, and you let it rotate around the axis. This is exactly what was happening in the dress of Miyake. And then instead of, it, of doing that three times, you do it an infinite number of times. And you get this picture. You get a fractal curve here. And this fractal curve everywhere has derivative plus one or minus one. And you let it rotate around the axis. And you create a surface which is obviously developable and which contains no segment. Because it, you have broken these pieces where the, which is ever, it's, it's nowhere smooth. So really, this is the construction of, of, of Lebesgue. Now, this Lebesgue was 1899. This is the, the best pleated dress you can imagine. It's a fractal pleated dress. Uh, that was 1899. And uh, some people, this is a, a, a construction that could be generalized. You do not have to cut on circles. You could cut on ellipses. Like, for example, you take this beautiful cone, you slice it by a plane, you get an ellipse, and you reflect one of the two parts by, by, by reflection uh, with this plane, and you get a surface which is obviously developable, even though it is not smooth. And if you do that several times, you can do that in paper. And this is a model that has been constructed by somebody called Huffman, rather recently, who is a computer scientist. And his idea was to try to understand what kind of model, how you can model a surface in a computer. And this is very easy to, easy to, to put in a computer. Now, let me show you how Miyake was his folding dresses, how he's using singularities, non-smooth objects. See, this is a very, it doesn't look like a dress, but it is a dress. Let me look at you. I show you how to unfold it. Let's unfold this dress. Miyake. Let me state a theorem about folding paper. This is a theorem due to Kawasaki, 1999. You take a piece of paper and you fold it many times. Like, for example, if, you, if your name is Miyaki and you construct this dress. So you see here a very complicated combination of segments and vertices. And the theorem of Kawasaki is the following. It says that if you pick one of these vertices, starting from this, vertex, from this vertex, you have always an even number of creases emanating from this point, and the alternating sum of the angles has to be zero. So A1 minus A2 plus A3 minus A4 plus A5 plus uh, minus A6 has to be zero. And it's a very interesting question of knowing if, conversely, if I draw a combination of lines, what you call a graph, and if you assume this condition is satisfied, can you unfold it? This seems to be a very interesting question. And the solution is negative, but it's almost positive, actually. OK, let's uh, uh, go further. Developable surfaces. Now, much later, in 1954, in 1954, Nash proved a wonderful theorem. He improved the idea of Lebesgue. I told you Lebesgue found counterexample to Euler, but his counterexamples were not smooth. They had no tangent planes. But Nash had the wonderful theorem that I state here. He says, there exists a surface 
which is smooth. Everywhere there is a very nice tangent space. Two is developable, which means you can clothe it with paper. And three, it is not ruled. You cannot find in it any segment. You could say, why isn't that a counterexample to the theorem of Euler? And the answer is that these examples are smooth. Yes, they have tangent space. They have first derivative, but they have no second derivative. They have no curvature. And the theorem of Euler requires two derivatives. So Euler is going further than, than, uh, than uh, Lebesgue. He gives an example of a surface which is smooth, not ruled, and developable. And his theorem is, uh, uh, was somehow published with an abstract mathematical proof. And we had to wait until last year before some, some colleagues could cre show it in picture. So I'm going to show you now the, the, the work of three uh, colleagues from Lyon and Grenoble. They produced a film showing this object. As far as I know, no designer is using this kind of smooth drapé, smooth pleated surfaces. But I think if there is a designer in the audience, that's a good idea. So that's a good idea. I wish I could see a dress modeled on what you are going to see now. Have a look. So this is a flat, smooth, not ruled surface. And I can guarantee it is very smooth because they constructed a 3D version of it and you can put your hand on it and it is indeed smooth. That is, you feel it smoothly. Okay. You could say enough with paper. None of us today has uh, paper on it. Let's go to cloth. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting story that uh, in 1878, Chebyshev uh, gave a talk in Paris, and the title of his talk was Sur la coupe des vêtements, on cutting cloth. And uh, 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 he wrote a draft version of his talk, but this draft version was not intended for publication. So in the collected papers of Chebyshev, it was written there that according to the wish of Chebyshev, this, uh, uh, paper, this draft on, uh, uh, on, on cutting cloth was not included in the collected papers. So I have been knowing this uh, summary for many years. And I have always been frustrated by the idea that there was something there, but I couldn't see what it was. And uh, 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 very recently, I was reading a PhD in history of mathematics. And as a footnote, the author of the PhD said that she had seen the draft. So I sent a message to her, uh, where did you see it? And the answer was, I forgot somewhere in Russia. <laughs> so I, 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 I sent a message to a, a, a former student of, of, me, of mine, which is, uh, who is uh, Russian, and he uh, was kind enough to look for it, and he found it. He found it in a box in the uh, basement of the uh, Academy of Sciences in, in St. Petersburg. And it was really moving for me to find this uh, handwritten draft of Chebyshev. So here's an ex example of what you see on this uh, uh, handwritten draft. 
So this is written in French, actually in good French, with no mistake. And uh, 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 it contains uh, uh, formulas. Most of them are wrong. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but this is full of good ideas. And uh, you know, you have formulas on the, on the right-hand side of the margin. It's really very interesting. It's a draft, but it's really a, a very interesting draft. And uh, I wanted to understand what he was doing. Uh, and uh, let me explain what he did. When you have cloth instead of paper, uh, cloth is not like paper. By it has two definite directions. Cloth is made out of two families of threads. The first one is called warp, and the other one weft. And these give some kind of geometry to your cloth, which is made out of little squares. And when you take a piece of cloth and when you deposit it on the surface, what's happening is that the little squares have the possibility of being deformed and become rhombuses. After the deformation, there is no reason that the perpendicular threads stay perpendicular. But if you assume that the threads are kind of uh, uh, inextendable, then it is clear that the length will be preserved along the threads, but the angle has no necessity to be preserved. So it's a very mathematical question. I give you a surface, and I ask you, is it possible to deposit on it a piece of cloth in such a way that the little squares, infinitesimal squares, are rhombuses? And that's the question that uh, uh, Chebyshev is, uh, is studying. And he kind of proves something. He proves that this is possible for half sphere. So in this draft, you have the following statement. It is possible to clothe half the sphere. So there exists a template that you can deposit on half the sphere in such a way that half the sphere is completely covered by your template. And the infinitesimal squares are rhombuses. That's the theorem of Chebyshev. Not only the theorem, but Chebyshev wanted to make it concrete. And in the same box in the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg, you find the template. So this is the template that Chebyshev cut in cardboard. So the theorem is this. You take this shape. You cut a piece of cloth with this shape. You deposit it on the top of a sphere. And the boundary will go to the equator. And the thing will deposit on the sphere with no wrinkle. This is the theorem of Chebyshev. Well, I wouldn't say theorem because, again, I think most proofs are incorrect. But uh, you can make it correct. And I was so amazed by this uh, theorem that, as any mathematician, when you read a theorem, you want to improve it. So I improved it. So here's my theorem. My theorem is the same, except that I can do twice better than Chebyshev. <laughs> Chebyshev can cover half the sphere. I can cover the full sphere. So the theorem is that there is a template. Uh, uh, there exists a template that can be deposited on the sphere in such a way that the infinitesimal warp weft squares are mapped to rhombuses. And as Chebyshev did, I did it. So here's my template. So the theorem is, if you cut a piece of cloth with this star-shaped shape, and the boundary of this uh, uh, star shape is very complicated, it's a transcendental function, it's uh, something complicated, I claim that if you deposit this, this on a sphere in such a way, say, that the center goes to the North Pole, the four corners will go to the, to the South Pole, and the thing will be perfectly adapted to the sphere. So I show you the, I show you the, 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 uh, the exact statement is this. There is a map from this star shape to the sphere, such that this map preserves the length 
along the warp and weft directions, which means that the two partial derivatives have length one, and the image of the phi of this map covers the sphere exactly once away from the seams on the boundary. So, you, you know, this is a complicated statement. The best is to show you the poof as a film. So this is the star shaped. Now I take a ball. The ball is rolling on the shape. And I will cover, I will wrap the sphere, as you can see here. And you can check that the squares are rhombuses. Under this deformation, the squares remain rhombuses. Now, I have a good friend in, in Lyon. He's an artist. He's interested by mathematics. And I came to him, and I showed him this theorem. And he said, you are a pure mathematician. I want to check if it's true or not with my hands. So he decided to construct, it, uh, to construct a model of it out of wood. So let me show you what he did. First, he decided to construct a sphere in wood. So he sliced many annuli in wood. He glued them. And then you have to smooth it. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and then he asked me to send the coordinates of the warp and weft. So I sent him the, the file containing the coordinate of the warp, warp and weft. And he did it using metallic uh, uh, things. And he produced this object that I like very much. So this is a proof of the theorem, uh, experimental proof. Now I'm going to show you another proof of it. And this other proof is really uh, modern technology, 3D printing. Here's a. Something you find on the net. You can print this Chebyshev net. This is just a 3D printing. And you see how flexible it is. This is something very flexible that you can use as a cloth. And now I show you what kind of cloth and kind of dress you can do with this 3D printing. You see rhombuses. And now I show you something else. Uh, uh, this is uh, the time for commercial. I will show you a private website. I have no financial interest in it. But I was really fascinated by the way uh, you can create today dresses or objects using 3D printings. And you can create your own private object. And uh, you will see. So this is, uh, this is advertisement. Look.
see, this is not very expensive. So what's behind this is a very fundamental concept in mathematics, which is flexibility. So here's a, a little theorem. If you take a disk and if you triangulate it, if you decompose it into triangles, and you ask yourself, what if you construct this disk out of rigid triangles, allowing some flexibility along the edges, is this object flexible or not? As you could see, the dress in this advertisement was very flexible. As soon as you create it, you can fold it and print it in a very compact way. Is it, why is it the case? Well, that's easy to compute that if you want to compute the number of degrees of freedom of such an object, you have to ask yourself the question, where should I put the vertices? So for each vertex, I have to choose three coordinates, x, y, z. So the number of unknowns is equal to three times the number of vertices. And then I have to write equations. And the equation is that for each edge, the length of the edge is pre-assigned. So for each edge, I have one equation telling me the distance between these two edges. So the degrees of freedom is equal to three times the number of vertices minus the number of edges. And then you have another degree of flexibility that you can rotate your object in space and you can translate it, which gives six additional degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom of a triangulated disk is three times the number of vertices minus the number of edges minus six. And if you use another theorem of Euler, you can easily check that this number is equal to the number of exterior edges minus three. So the result is this, that if you have a triangulated disk with many edges on the boundary, the object is very flexible. And the flexibility is basically equal to the number of edges on the boundary minus three. So the dresses that you have seen has many, have many edges on the boundary. Each one gives you one degree of freedom, so it's much enough to fold everything in a little box and to print it folded. Now, if you take something very little, a little bit different, like the, the Stanford bunny, and if you do the same computation, but now it's not a disk anymore. It's a sphere. It's homeomorphic to a sphere. You have to compute, again, the number of degrees of freedom, three times the number of vertices minus the number of edges minus six. And believe me, or believe Euler, the result is zero. And this is why an object with no boundary, like this bunny, is typically something rigid. So this is something that you should keep in mind. Flexibility comes from the boundary, which is a very fundamental idea in mathematics. So here's an example of a flexible object. Again, Miyake. You see that this bag is flexible because it has a boundary. And you can see uh, uh, the flexibility of these dresses, uh, even though they are neither disks nor spheres, we can compute the, the flexibility. And this is a, a local picture of this dress. I'm not sure I would use it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's come to Zeeman. Zeeman uh, is really the founder, or one of the founders, of catastrophe theory. So I will, of course, not discuss catastrophe theory today. It's, uh, it would be too long. But again, let me say in a few words that this is understanding the shapes of folds and cusps. And a typical example of folds and cusps occur, of, of course, in cloth. And it is because of that I'm, I'm convinced that uh, Zeeman was interested by understanding the shape of a cloth. So uh, here's a picture showing you a, pic a surface rotating in space. And you see these special lines that we, told, we call the contour and which explain the surface. This is exactly what, what uh, um, Zeeman was interested in. 
So I told you he wrote a paper on uh, uh, cutting a dress for his wife. So it's a very interesting paper, not long. So he explains that dressmaking can raise interesting questions in both geometry and topology. My own involvement began in Bangkok, where I once bought a dress length of some rather beautiful Thai silk. Unfortunately, when I got home, all the dressmakers claimed it wasn't long enough to make a dress. It became clear that I had to either abandon the project or make the thing myself. Now, I had never made a dress before, nor any garment for that matter. So I thought it would be amusing to try designing it from scratch. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. In my innocence, I chose a simple sleeveless summer dress with a princess line, or in layman's language, it just consisted of two panels, one at the front and one at the back, sewn together at the, at the sides. What I had not realized was that the simpler the dress, the more accurately it has to fit. As a precaution, I first tried a mock-up made out of an old sheet. And a good thing, too, because the result was hopeless. When she tried it on, it hardly fitted anywhere. I slowly began to realize that I did not yet understand the basic mathematical problem of how to fix to fit a flexible flat surface around a curved surface. So back to the drawing board to do a little differential geometry. And then he becomes, becomes a paper. I will not read the paper, but he explains, he explains the basic of differential geometry of uh, warp and weft and how you deform the claws, etc., etc. And then, you know, this is a typical picture from topology. So I wonder what his wife was thinking of that. <laughs> and, uh, and the end of the paper is the most uh, interesting uh, uh, part of the paper. It's uh, a comment by Lady Zeman. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Lady Zeman says, well, she's happy. She says, the length of cloth brought back from Bangkok and declared by all to be insufficient, uh, insufficient for a dress was ivory colored Thai silk with two bands of delicate color, one dove gray and the other cafe au lait, woven into either end. From this, Sir Christopher, it's good to, to, to call your, your, your husband, your husband, Sir Christopher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sir Christopher designed and made a princess line dress doing all the cutting, machining, and, and hand finishing himself. It had a scoop neckline, no sleeve, and fell to just below the knee with an eight inch zip hidden in the side seam. It lined throughout and skimmed the figure in a manner both comfortable and elegant. It was a great pleasure to wear as well as being very pleasing to the eye. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, the figure outgrew the dress in time. <laughs> uh, it was given away. But a long evening skirt of five panels in chestnut colored velvet with cream flowers, also designed and made by Sir Christopher for his wife, for Lady Zeman, is still frequent in use. Okay, so time to go back to Thurston. And actually, Thurston worked in the last years of his life. He worked on paper. And when I said he worked on paper, really, he worked on paper. Look at pictures. Uh, these are pictures from 2010. And you see, he worked on paper, trying to design dresses out of paper. So let me try to tell you what he did and what he proved, because he proved the theorem, except that a little bit like Chebyshev, he gave no proof. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a beautiful theorem, even though I'm not even cl clear to me that I can state it correctly. But you will see. I will show it to you. So here's the, I begin by stating a theorem which is due to 
uh, uh, Pogorelov, 1970, what I believe Thurston was not aware of. Theorem says the following. You cut in paper two domains, two convex domains, one in red and one in, in yellow, and you assume that these two convex domains have the same perimeter. And then you have these two pieces of paper, and you glue the boundaries by some adhesive tape or whatever. Since the boundaries have the same length, in principle, you can do it. And what uh, Pogorelov sa said, that it's possible to do it, and you construct in this space an object in space, which is convex and rigid, something like that. The two pieces will fold. The boundary will become some kind of non-planar curve. And you construct a very beautiful object. This theorem is far from obvious. You take two convex domains of the same perimeter. You glue the boundary. You construct a convex plane. Not only that, but Pogorelov proved that even if the domains are not convex, you can still do it under the condition that points which are glued together should be such that the sum of the two curvatures should be positive, which means that you are allowed it to have some con concave places, but the concave places should be glued to a con con convex place in such a way that the convexity is stronger than the concavity. And the theorem is that if you do that, you do construct an object, a convex object, which is somehow the result of the wedding of these two objects. And this is exactly what Thurston did, uh, 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 what he was planning to do. So here's the last paper of Thurston. I think it's not even, it's not even published. It's a paper with uh, Kelly Delp. And uh, uh, it's, it's a wonderful paper. Uh, except that there is no proof, but beautiful picture. And uh, let me show you what this paper contains. Look at these very strange shapes. So basically, they are like triangles, except that the edges of these triangles are very wiggly. They are very uh, complicated. So you have eight shapes like that. And what Thurston did is that he chose these very specific shapes in such a way that if you glue these eight shapes together, you get something which is almost a sphere. So here's the picture. So you have to be clever enough, and I can guarantee Thurston was, you have to be clever enough to choose the right shape for the boundary of these objects in such a way that you can apply the theorem of Pogorelov. Not only that, but the resulting object is almost spherical. The difference between this and a sphere is very small. So what I believe, but there is no statement in the paper of Thurston, I believe that there is behind that some kind of theorem that gives sufficient conditions for gluing things which produce something almost spherical. Uh, I must admit, I, don't, I couldn't find a, a statement. But there should be a statement like that. If you glue two objects uh, uh, along their boundaries, and if, this, if these objects are sufficiently wiggly or sufficiently complicated, it should be the case that the resulting object is, is, uh, is almost a sphere. Well, you could say, as people would complain against Chebyshev or Thurston, that most human bodies are not spheres. <laughs> and uh, this is probably the main problem with this theory. And not, even, not even convex. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. We have a large body that's all the same. You know, the, the world is large, but. We make many differences on the surface. Most people look at the little differences on the surfaces, <laughs> yeah. and somebody like him sees how the whole picture fits together. So mathematics and design are, are both expressions of the human creative spirit. And he made the connection. He called me, and um, I think 
he and his team worked very, very hard to try to make something out of, out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, so the seams are very smooth because they are. Say the, sorry, the question was uh, yep. for his way of having cloth that would cover the whole sphere. Is there a way to uh, get rid of the seams? Is that the question? Uh, by topological reasons, it's not possible. You have to have seams. You know, you cannot map. Uh, 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 Yeah, once, I don't know how to answer that. You have to have some singularities anyway. And I think this is the simplest singularity you could have. Yeah, so you have to have seams anyway. Yeah, that's very, that's very different because um, uh, in the case of this motion by Ismail, uh, of course, little squares do not go to rhombuses. And this is the most difficult problem here, to make it such that you do cloth it. That's the main problem. That's the main mathematical question. That's, uh, that's a very uh, interesting question. Let me just yeah, the, the question. question. Sorry, like, yeah. His question was, uh, what other surfaces? This here was a, a ball was covered, but the question is, could you cover other, cover other shapes in this way? Yeah, so I can say something about it. When I, my friend, uh, made, the artist, made it out of wood, uh, he said to me, okay, now you can do that with a sphere. Can you do it with an egg? So as like an ellipsoid, for example. And then I discovered that I cannot do it. So uh, uh, I tried to do it hard. Is it possible to cover, is there a similar picture for a rugby ball? And uh, I tried hard, and the best I can do is, but my, my friend made, made fun of me, uh, I can prove that there is an epsilon such that the three different axes of the, el of the ellipsoid are differ by epsilon, then I can close it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see that you make fun of me too. <laughs> so, okay, so this is, uh, okay, there is an epsilon such that, but I don't know if epsilon is one tenth or one, one hundredth, I know nothing about that. And uh, indeed, it's a very good question. Can you close, let's say, a convex domain? Suppose you have a convex domain, is there a similar picture? This I don't know. Well, of, uh, 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 the question is, do, do I know something which cannot be clothed? Uh, uh, the answer is yes, if you have a high genus surface, because there are some kind of inequality for the area of such an object. The integral of curvature is bound by 4 pi. So if you want to cover uh, uh, a higher genus surface, you need more pieces. So, uh, but that is cheating. I mean, the real question is, can, you, can I clothe a convex object? which is the question I'd like to solve. But I don't know how to do that. So my, my, my friend tried to do it with, uh, you know these orange nets? So he tried to, he bought an orange net and he tried to cover, because my friend not only builds uh, spheres out of wood, but he also builds uh, ellipsoids. So uh, he offered me for Christmas an ellipsoid. <laughs> and <laughs> And then you can try, with you have an ellipsoid, you try to wrap it. But when you try to do it, you, you see singularities which appear around what we would call the South Pole. And really, this is not a surprise because the partial differential equations that you try to solve are hyperbolic partial differential equations which are very famous for having shocks and singularities. So I would not be surprised that some surfaces, some convex surfaces are not Clothable, but I don't know. The, 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 on this picture? Well, 
Yeah. 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 So, so no, no, I didn't say... Just, no. Wait, let me just repeat yep. the question. His question was, in this, the, the net, the... Um, the unfolded. This yeah, one. the unfolding. Is it, is it actually smooth? Like yes. This is, what, I, what I wanted to say, this is, this is indeed smooth. This is analytic. But this is, you know, some people say that and they think it's a, it's a piece of a circle. No, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a parallel wave function. It's something very sophisticated. So it's very smooth, but it's not a circle. The boundary, this, you mean this, this yellow part? Yeah, yeah. 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 Any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank Professor Keese again for a wonderful talk.